The speaker needs to pray for the listeners as much as the listeners for the speaker. The afternoon shift after lunch, we'll pray that we can hold the attention as we uh, spend this time together. Have you been blessed this morning? Yes. I've really been encouraged by the, the presentations and uh, stirring up the mind. Uh, Tersha shared some thoughts that uh, set my mind thinking and uh, Elder Van Annenberg with some thoughts on the abomination that I hadn't thought about before, which was really enlightening and uh, it's really good to learn and uh, grow together. I'm enjoying what I understand is a spirit of inquiry without condemnation, the ability to search and question without being looked upon as if you are stupid, uh, like many of us have experienced, uh, and so I'm very much enjoying the safety of this uh, environment, and uh, may it continue uh, where we persuade one another in love from the scriptures, uh, and not from my opinion based on a creed. Uh, this is not the way God's people want to operate. So uh, can we kneel together and uh, we'll pray. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to come on your blessed day of rest that we may enter into your presence to taste of your spirit of rest, that great peace which comes to us through the Lord Jesus. We pray that as we enter into this subject that you would speak to our minds and that you would guide us. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you can see, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on the board. Uh, and so I'll be moving back and forth uh, a little bit. Maybe that'll help keep some of you away because you can keep up with where I am. Uh, but the subject I want to talk to you about this afternoon, and I had put this later on in the schedule, but I'm moving it forward and I want to expand this, uh, these, these presentations, is on the divine pattern. Now, uh, in Australia, we say, we say divine pattern, but that doesn't seem to be translating too well here in the US. So I've tried to put the R in, say divine pattern. So, uh, <laughs> sounds very funny for an Australian to speak like this, but... Uh, and maybe even you are not used to it, but uh, that's, that's, uh, we try and accommodate, we try and uh, help everyone out there. So, uh, I, uh, coming back to uh, these verses in uh, Malachi chapter 4, Malachi chapter 4. We were looking last night, I mentioned to you how in uh, verses 5 and 6 we have the story of Elijah, the message of Elijah, and in verse 4, the message of Moses uh, to remember the statutes and the judgments. Of course, when we think of uh, the message of Elijah, Elijah for these last days is the preaching of the third angel's message. It's a calling to a worship of the true God, fear God and keep his commandments, or fear God and worship him that made heaven and earth. This is all part of the Elijah message. And of course, when John the Baptist came, he identified himself with a passage of scripture when he was asked by the Pharisees, who are you and by what authority do you do, you do these things? And his reply to them was what? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And we want to turn there. Isaiah 40 is a beautiful passage. It starts with, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Do God's people need comfort? We do. Well, this is a passage of comfort. Verse 3, of course, is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The mountains will be brought down, the valleys will be raised up, and a highway will be prepared for our God. And it says, as you come down through this passage, it says in verse 9, the last three words is what I want to focus on this afternoon. The last three words of this passage is, Behold your God. This, this is what the message of comfort is, to behold your God. When we behold our God just as he is, we will receive comfort. But much more than this, we will receive uh, the key that unlocks all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge by beholding our God. This is, this is what I want to uh, deal with uh, this afternoon. Uh, and 
If you would like to turn uh, in your Bibles to um, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 2 says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all riches to the full assurance and understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So now he's speaking of the Father and of Christ. And what are the next words? In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How much Wisdom and knowledge is found in the Father and in the Son. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in the Father and the Son. Now we understand according to 2 Corinthians 3.18 it says that but we all with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory for by beholding we become changed. So what I want us to do this afternoon is to behold our God and see the key that unlocks all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And uh, this particular subject excites me very much because I'm seeing something in the scripture that, uh, that I think that Albert Einstein would be very envious of. Because apart from his great uh, uh, theory of E equals MC squared, after that he began to search for the theory of everything. I could have saved Albert a lot of trouble because in the scriptures I have found the fact of everything. It's not even a theory, it's a fact. It's in the Bible and I'd like to show it to you. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. We want to behold our God as the scripture reveals this to us. But to us, verse Corinthians 8, 6, but to us there is but one God, the Father, and what are the next two words? I've got it up on the board. Of whom are how many things? All things. There is one God, the Father, of whom are all things. And we, uh, what does it say? And we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. All things are of the Father, all things are through the Son. And what I would like to suggest to you that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in this reality, that there is one God the Father of whom are all things and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things. And in beholding this relationship between the Father and the Son, and we are told in John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In knowing these two, we have the formula for eternal life. And it's found in one source, of whom, if I can use that word source, of whom, and channel. Channel, these are terms that the spirit of prophecy uses. So I'm, I'm comfortable. Some people are a little uncomfortable with a channel because it has other meanings, but the spirit of prophecy uses it plenty of times. A channel of blessing. And so uh, this pattern, of whom, by whom, source, channel, I would like to suggest forms the basis of many, many things in our lives. For instance, all of us come into this life through this principle. There is a source, the male husband providing the seed. The seed is given to his wife and then she then nurtures the seed and becomes the agency or the channel by which the child is brought into life. We come into this world through a source channel principle. The male being the source, the wife being the channel. Does, does that make sense? This is how we, we come into this world. There are there are uh, other things that uh, I find interesting. Notice uh, the relationship. There is a relationship between the two great lights that are uh, given to us in the heavens, the sun and the moon. Now, can you look at the sunlight directly for very long? You cannot look upon the sun. If you want to look directly at sunlight, what do you have to look at? The moon. 
The sun's light comes through the moon. The, mo the sun is the source, the moon is the channel, and through the channel of the moon, we can behold sunlight. It's an interesting source-channel relationship, isn't it? It's not an accident. These are not two heavenly bodies that independently have their own light source. There is one light source, but there are two heavenly bodies that, by which this light comes. Is this an accident? No, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in this principle of of whom and by whom. And this is the way that the universe uh, it operates. I would like to suggest to you two other principles by beholding the Father and the Son that uh, are of interest to us and the second one is in Colossians uh, again in Colossians chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 speaking of Christ says who is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus is the image, the visible image of the invisible God. So I want to write this down. I'll climb around the speakers. We have, we can restate this as source and channel. And number two, it's not in every case, but in many cases we have invisible and visible. Let's give an example of this. When you hear the term Word of God, what comes to your mind? The Bible and? Okay. Which one is visible? The Bible is visible. Jesus currently is invisible to human sight. How do we access the invisible? Through the visible. The Bible being the word of God gives us access to the, to the living word, which is Jesus Christ. This is an example of invisible, visible, and both of them must be present. If someone is reading the word of God and claiming to be teaching the word of God, and yet is living a life in contradiction to the word of God, they have not connected themselves to the living word, have they? They've only taken hold of the written word, and they have not connected to the living word, because the Bible itself is, is a channel, is a way to lead us to Christ. And this is, this is a key principle. If someone claims to be having visions from Jesus, and they're getting these beautiful visions, but it doesn't agree with the written word, we can't follow it, can we? The pattern is broken of invisible, visible. Just another really quick one. When we think about invisible and visible, and this is something I'm sure you will appreciate, the, old, uh, the, the, the sanctuary system. How many sanctuaries are described for us in the Bible? Two sanctuaries. Behold your God. What is the relationship between the two sanctuaries? Invisible? Visible. The earthly sanctuary was designed to be a channel to the invisible. Does that make sense? We have two priesthoods. We have a Melchizedek priesthood and an Aaronic priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood, did anybody in the time of, uh, of, the time of Moses pray in Aaron's name? No. He, he was only an earthly representative of Christ, the only mediator between God and man, which was our mediator. So I'm just laying out some principles of how invisible and visible uh, might work. Actually, uh, some others that I think could really uh, help uh, in, in a lot of the conflicts that we have amongst God's people. I had explained to me uh, that when you describe faith and works, faith and works are like two oars in a boat. Have you ever heard this illustration? And you've just got to keep them in balance. Well, that's, that's not in the Bible. If, if we put up the relationship between faith and works, I would say, behold your God. What's the relationship? Galatians tells us, faith that work works. Faith that works. Faith invisible works visible. The faith of Christ manifested in our life, it's faith that works. 
It's not two things that are balancing together, but it is one that leads to the other. And when you have faith that works, then the commandments of God are not grievous, are they? The statutes are not grievous because, you know, I read in the, the, the book of Hebrews that, uh, that Moses kept the Passover by faith. So regardless of what anyone says that it's a bunch of works, Moses kept it by faith, so somehow it must be possible to keep it by faith. Faith that produces statute keeping. Not, not statute keeping and faith working side by side. It's faith that produces the statute keeping. When you understand father and son and you allow the father and son relationship to, to, to uh, come into this equation, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge become unraveled to you, that it's faith that works. Now let me give you another, another uh, this is often perceived as a balance equation. Okay, we might say, um, here's, uh, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, reason, what normally goes as the, what is understood to be the counterbalance of reason? Emotion. You know, you get people that are very logical and uh, can read from the scriptures and they're deadpan face and just very staid. They're, they're all about reason. But uh, God says, come now, let us reason together. But when he reasons with us, is there any way that you can stay still and not have any emotion? Isn't there a, a word that burns within your soul, like Jeremiah said? It burned in my heart. You can't contain it. The invisible, the reasoning process that is going on in the invisible must manifest itself in emotion. So reason and emotion are also made in the image of father and son, of the of whom and by whom. Reason is to control emotion. Emotion is not to control reason. Reason is not co-equal with emotion. It is the head of emotion. These, it's quite simple really, isn't it? It's a very simple process. And it's, it's building all of these things upon the truth that there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. You have this source-channel relationship. And uh, as you can see, I've got a bit of emotion about this. <laughs> as I'm reasoning this through, I'm going, wow, this is amazing. If only Albert Einstein understood this. So number three, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. I want to share with you the third principle. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Speaking of Christ, it says that Christ is the what? The brightness? The brightness. Brightness of his own glory? Brightness of whose glory? Okay, the Father has glory. And the Son is the brightness. He is the magnification. And we know that the law of God is a transcript of God's character. And Jesus said in Isaiah 42, 21, He shall magnify the law and make it honorable. The brightness of in the person of Jesus, we see a magnifying glass placed upon the character of the Father. In this was manifest the love of God, in that he gave his only begotten Son. As we look upon the Son upon the cross, we see a magnification of the Father's love in giving his only begotten Son. And so these three principles, I would suggest to you, just by looking at the relationship that there exists between Father and Son, of source and channel, invisible, visible, what do we see in the book, Early Writings, when Ellen White asked Jesus, does the Father have a form like yourself? Yes, he does. But if you were to behold it, you would cease to exist. Invisible. But Jesus, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have touched, and our hands have handled the word of life. Visible. Uh, and then, of course, the glory and the brightness. These 
uh, three principles uh, I would suggest to you have a tremendous impact upon how we look upon many things in Scripture. And now I want to unpack some of these because there are many twos that occur uh, in the documents that we have that we need to ask what is the relationship between these two. Now before I go into any more examples, I want to uh, just lay out for you that if we do a diagram where God the Father is the source and His Son is the channel and all of the Father's glory in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily so the Father's glory is passing through the Son and is magnified out to the universe. Now there is another principle that Satan introduced to this universe and it is through this principle that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who cannot see, of course. Uh, let's have a look at that. Second uh, Corinthians 4.4. 4. We just want to look at that verse. Because I believe this is the principle. Second Corinthians. four four. Verse, uh, verse 3, we need to read that. But if our gospel be hid, it be, is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Notice how even here he mentions, speaking of Christ, who is the image of God. So he brings out this principle that this principle is being violated. The God of this world introduces a new principle that is not based on source and channel, but is based on something very different. And this is what we find in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, where he says, I will ascend into heaven. You know the verse. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Stay with me, it, it, it gets really interesting as we go along. Everyone surviving lunch? Getting a bit heavy in the eyes. Uh, 14, 13. This is what Lucifer said. He said, I will ascend into heaven. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation. Very familiar text. The Moedim. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So what Lucifer is telling us is that he will occupy a position here. So that the relationship now is no longer source and channel, but it is source and source. Two sources. I will be like the most high. This creates a different pattern of thinking. This is a situation where now you are required to counterbalance. You are required, you have a now attention because when you have two sources, you've got to balance those sources. Okay? Now, this can sometimes be manifested in people's prayers when they say, Dear Father, thank you for dying on the cross. There's a confusion between who you're talking to, who is the source and who is the mediator. This can become confused when you have two sources. You can get lost in the confusion. And then there is an attempt when, this is a very important principle, that when you have two sources like this, the human mind tries to reconcile the tension. And the way that you reconcile a tension is... Um, let me describe it for you in Eastern thought. Okay, the circle is good because in Eastern thought, you bring the two circles together. Have you seen that before? Yin and Yang. It's a source source principle that is brought together as one. But there's still tension. In Western philosophy, we are indebted to a man by the name of Hegel who came up with the idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Have you, if you've ever listened to Walter Weith, you'll have heard this. 
thesis. It's the same thing. It's two sources, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Bringing two sides that are in opposition together. All of the democratic governments of the world are built on this philosophy. In Australia, we have the Liberal Party and we have the Labour Party. And these are the government and the opposition. And these two parties that are at war with each other form one inharmonious government. Uh, here it's uh, the Republican Party and the Democrats. And they form one inharmonious government. And that's why you're... No, I won't say anything while I'm here. I'm only a visitor. <laughs> it's not wise for me to... <laughs> Do not speak evil of dignitaries. Pray for those in leadership. Okay. I'm resisting the temptation. So, <laughs> two sources. This is, this is the, how the God of this world. Now, now, let's apply this principle. This is where it gets really interesting. I want to show you how a two source principle can really begin to screw up your thinking. Because when you are looking at the Bible, this is one book, but how many parts? Two parts. It's behold your God. What is the relationship between the two parts? This is the question we need to ask. Let me show you how uh, a two-source uh, a two-source idea can be introduced to cause confusion. If you turn in your Bibles to uh, John 1.17, I want to show you uh, something that in the King James reflects this co-source thinking and has been brought into the Bible. And before you get distressed, it's a supplied word. So it's not in the text. And having uh, gone to Europe and, and, and got several people to read different translations of this, I find that many of the other translations have not made this mistake, like the King James translators. And this verse is very significant for those of us who believe in the statutes and the judgments. John 1.17 For the law was given by Moses. What's the next word in the King James? But... So the conjunction between the law of, uh, given by Moses and the grace that comes by Jesus Christ is joined together by a conjunction that says, but. Now, but suggests what? It's cancelling out. So when you've got two sources, the human mind tries to reconcile these two. And the one, one way you reconcile the two is to cancel one of them out. The other way is to superimpose them as one denying the individuality and personality of both. This is a really important principle. So the word there, for the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What is the reason that you need grace? What, but what, what is grace? Power, to do what? Keep the commandments of God. Law and grace are a source channel relationship. You know, the, the Mount Horeb, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, from the mountain of Horeb, where the Ten Commandments were carved out, on, in Exodus chapter 17, before the word was spoken, a life stream came out of the rock and flowed out for the people. And that water symbolized the living water of Christ which was available to God's people. So the living water comes first, and then the words come. So when you hear the words, and it says, thou shalt not, it's, you will not, because you have the living water in your life. The law, which was, was the law ordained to life, is that what it says in Romans 7? The law, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded our minds with an idea, a pattern of thinking that is co-source rather than source channel. Now what I'm, what I'm saying to you is that the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament is not source-source. It is source-channel. The Old Testament is the source. 
The New Testament is the channel. The, the Old Testament is the glory. Was not the ministry of Moses glorious? The New Testament is the brightness, not of its own glory, but of the Old Testament. Does that make sense? This starts to get really exciting, doesn't it? The relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament reflects the relationship that we understand of the Father and the Son. When we worship the Father and Son in spirit and in truth, the Old Testament and the New Testament open up to us in a relationship that allows us to unlock all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I hope that point will stay in your thinking because this is, this is the reward for those who avoid idolatry. When you enter into idolatry, your ability to read Scripture correctly becomes perverted. And this is why in the statutes, what does it say in Deuteronomy chapter 6? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, but further on down the chapter, it says in verse 13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around you. Because when you do that, your ability to read the word of God and to see this pattern correctly becomes perverted. I would like to suggest to you that there are Amongst other things, within the Advent movement of God's people, in particular, there has been three great battles. And all these three battles have centered around an understanding of source and channel versus source and source. The first one was the relationship of the Father and the Son, which was occurring in the early time of the pioneer period. How was Christ equal with God? This was, the, this was the discussion that was going on for many of them. And the 1888 message clearly showed how that Christ inherited all things from his Father and he was made equal with the Father. 8 Testimonies 2.68, he was made equal with the Father, but given all these things. The next great battle, of course, that developed uh, after our pioneers passed was the relationship between the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. What is the relationship between the spirit of prophecy and the Bible? Are they co-equal or are they source and channel? Where does all authority from what we believe come from? It only comes from the Bible. It doesn't come from it, the spirit of prophecy. But the spirit of prophecy is to magnify and to expand what is written in the Bible. It is not a source in itself. It is not an end in itself. The spirit of prophecy is to lead you to the Bible. The prophet herself said, Brethren, I commend to you the word of God. Read the Bible. Whereas for many years, the, uh, the, the spirit of prophecy was elevated above the scriptures. And, and this, is, this is what we see, the pattern of thinking that existed for Satan is originally he wanted to elevate himself to be equal with God. But once he had elevated himself in his own mind to this position, he actually sat in the temple of God claiming to be God and was above God. So this pattern actually of elevating the channel to be co-equal with the source makes the channel above the source. Am I speaking Chinese now? You with me? What do most of the Protestant churches, when you're dealing with the New Testament, if we change this to Old Testament and New Testament, and then most of the Christian churches elevate the New Testament, but they end up getting rid of the Old Testament. They elevate the channel above the source and they pervert both. This is what most Christians are doing with the Bible. But if we, if we remember the source and the channel of Father and Son, we can never do this. We have a religion now in many, in many places where Christ is elevated at the expense of his Father. And that's a natural consequence of a mind that elevates the channel to be above the source. And I'm talking about patterns of thinking. And this is patterns of thinking uh, affect us. When I was uh, in uh, Germany, I had the privilege of driving on one of the autobahns. And we're driving along uh, at uh, 
130 kilometers an hour. It's about 85 miles an hour. We're driving along at about 80, 85 miles an hour, and all of a sudden this BMW or this Audi would go past, <laughs> just like that, at 200, 220 kilometers an hour, 170 miles an hour. And uh, I'm, I'm from Australia. Uh, Peter will understand my suffering here because we drive on the left side of the road. <laughs> uh, not the wrong side of the road, as many of you have taunted me. <laughs> we, you drive on the right side, but we drive on the left side. So I'm driving this car, it's a manual car, I'm, I'm, I'm driving on the right-hand side of the road, and it's a manual car, and I go to change gears, and this hand goes down to change the gears and bangs into the door. Oh, oh, oh it's this side. There was a pattern of thinking in my mind that automatically, and so this hand sort of comes out and it feels very strange, and I'm trying to change this gear. And, you know, it was really, really dangerous because you're looking in the rear vision mirror to see this car coming at 170 miles an hour, and I'm looking out the window because I've got a pattern of thinking that's the wrong way in, the, in this situation. Having a wrong pattern of thinking can get you in a lot of trouble because you're thinking in a way that's automatic. To, to give you another illustration, I want to underscore this. I was very, very pleased with myself when I, we were in Chattanooga and we were flying to Florida because in the airports you have many um, entries into the toilets where there's two, there's two ways you can go in. Now, the first time I came to the United States, when I came, I came in to go into the toilet, I went to the left and I banged into everyone that was coming out because I go to the left. I just automatically went to the left. Now that I've been here for, for six months, when I went to the toilet, I automatically went to the right, and then I realized I did it without even thinking. I thought, oh, I'm going to have trouble when I go home now. <laughs> so uh, patterns are very, very important. And uh, who Jesus is, because as I had written on the board, everyone knows that the Father is a source. We all know this. But many of us have been taught that Christ is also the source. But the Bible presents Christ as the channel. I do nothing of myself. What I hear, that I do. He is the way. He says, I am the way to who? The Father. And, and therefore, understanding who Jesus is is a channel. is the only way we're ever going to find the Father. So knowing who Jesus is, knowing his identity, knowing who he is as the begotten Son of God is critical to getting this pattern correct and reading the Bible correctly. Am I making sense? The way, the truth, and the life. Christ Jesus, uh, knowing him as the begotten Son, is life to us. He that hath the Son hath life. And has the Father, First uh, John 2.21. If you want the Father, you have to have the Son. If you want the Son, you have to have the Father. And as it says in Revelation 14.1, to be sealed with the Father's name. If you want to be sealed with the Father's name in your forehead, you have to believe that he has a Son. This is, this is uh, what we're talking about. So now I want to share with you some other things that I find really fascinating. When we look at the sanctuary, the temple in heaven, forgive my diagram... Uh, if it's a bit uh, incorrect. So, you've got, in heaven, you've got the temple. How many rooms? Obvious question. Two rooms. What is the relationship between the two rooms? Isn't this the, the channel to take you into the source? The holy place, the, the bread of life, the light of the world... The intercession of Christ is designed to bring you before the Father, the source of all. So the relationship between these two apartments are channel and source. Now this is where I get really excited. When you come into the most holy place, how many documents are there in the most holy place? <laughs> I heard one and I heard two. Which is it? Two documents. Big question. Now the God that you worship will determine how you answer this question. What is the relationship between the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Law? 
source channel. Okay. You see it? This is a magnification of the Ten Commandments. Can I read you? Are you getting excited like me? Can I read you a few statements? I find this really exciting. Uh, you're familiar with these things. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364. These directions relating to the duty of the people uh, to God and to one another and to the stranger were only the principles of the Ten Commandments amplified. Whoa, didn't we just, isn't, don't we have a principle over there about that? Amplification. The statutes and the judgments are an amplification. And this is what we see. The other thing that is really interesting about this is that we believe as God's people that on the antitypical day of atonement that God's people by faith entered the most holy place. Now in the types, if the book of the law finished at the cross, then where should the book of the law have been kept? Shouldn't have been here? What's it doing in this most holy place? Does, does that mean it has relevance after 1844? Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? So, have you ever thought, because the Ten Commandments are a transcript of the Father's character, is that right? So the Father is seated upon the throne. Who is seated at the right hand of the Father? In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I come to do thy will, oh my God. The book of the law is Christ. So when we say that the book of the law was nailed to the cross, we say, yes, it was Jesus who was nailed to the cross. He is the book of the law. But guess what? He rose from the dead. He lives. The book of the law lives. It rose from the grave. <laughs> it didn't stay in the tomb. It represents the Son of God. Is this, this is exciting stuff. I, the relationship between these two documents is really, really interesting. So um, once you start thinking like this, you begin to think about what other patterns are there that, or that represent the Father and the Son. Uh, you, you begin to think about them. Uh, and, and so this... Now I want to share with you something that really is important in terms of the, the Old Testament. Now let me just read you one quote that just confirms. I want to read you one quote. Uh, I might have to do it is written for you. It's in Christ's Object Lessons. And it says, I can't find it here. Anyway, if you, you look up, uh, it's in Christ's Object Lessons, it talks about the law is the root and the gospel is the blossom and fruit. And when she says the law, she's talking about the Old Testament. When she's talking about the gospel, she's talking about the New Testament. So the Old Testament is the root and the New Testament is the fruit. That's a source channel relationship uh, where one is not being uh, taken away, and, and, but it's source and channel. So uh, when we continue on in this way, uh, remember when I talked about the sun and the moon? Sun and the moon, there is a divine pattern relationship. Um, this world is referred to as the night of sin and woe. Is that right? Have you heard that? We're in the valley of the shadow of death during the night time. The father hands over uh, the great controversy to his son. The son is the one that guides us through the night of sin and woe. Uh, in the sun and, and the moon relationship, this is some of the types that we can look at. Now, in terms, I now want to ask you a question, and I, I think it's probably best if we summarize at this point. When you think about the Bible, there's a source channel relationship between the Old and the New Testament. There happens to be two parts to the Bible. The law of God, and I, I didn't even mention this one. The Ten Commandments, how many parts? Two parts. What's the relationship? 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment. And you shall love your neighbor and your soul, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On this hang all the law and the prophets. But it's the last, the last six come about because of the first four. So there's a source channel relationship within the Ten Commandments. Now, I, I want to share with you something. I'll just take it a little bit further because in the heart of the Ten Commandments, in the Fourth Commandment and the Fifth Commandment, it, what's really interesting is Commandments 1 to 3 all are saying, not, not, not. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then Commandments 6 to 10 are also saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. There's only two commandments that tell you to do something. The first one is the fourth commandment, says remember, and the fifth commandment is honour. Okay, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We are honouring the, honoring the one who is the source of our life, aren't we? That's the fourth commandment. The fifth commandment, we are honouring the ones who are the channel by which we receive life. Honour your mother and your father that your days may be long. At the heart of the Ten Commandments is an honouring of this source and channel relationship. Can you see it? It's pretty exciting, isn't it? I, I, I find that fascinating. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the Ten Commandments are a divine pattern of source and channel. The Bible is a divine pattern. The, the, the Ten Commandments and the book, and the book of the Law are a divine pattern of source and channel. The sanctuary service is a divine pattern with two apartments, source and channel. It's everywhere. The Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, source and channel. The way we come into this world, father and mother, source and channel. It's all the same. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I hope that you're getting as excited as I am when I realize the implications of these things. So I began to think, we're running out of time. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll just, I'll have to uh, introduce this because I'll come back to this in, in the next presentation. Uh, but I began to think, the seventh day Sabbath, is there a divine pattern in the seventh day Sabbath? I begin to think, how many types of Sabbaths are there in the Bible? We, I need, that's a hard question because there's, there's land Sabbaths and there's... Let, let me rephrase that. Um, the, we have the seventh day Sabbath, which is based on the earth's Earth's rotation in relationship to the sun. And then we have the annual Sabbaths, which are based on the Earth's rotation in relationship to the moon. Is that right? Is there a divine pattern relationship between sun and moon? Is there a divine pattern relationship between the weekly Sabbath and the annual Sabbath? My conclusion is yes. It makes sense, doesn't it? Now, I, I, want to, I, I want to share with you something just really interesting that came to me recently because when you have this divine pattern principle of source and channel, if we put up the days of the week, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the seventh day is the Shabbaton of the Shabbat. It is the rest of the Sabbath on the seventh day. We believe this is what God's people, all those who worship uh, the God of the Bible, believe that on the seventh day, if you come to God on the Sabbath, that you will receive a special uh, outpouring of His Spirit. Isn't that what we believe? A special uh, reception of, of the Spirit of God, which then carries you through the rest of the week. When we say day one, it's day one to what? The day one of the Sabbath. Day two of the Sabbath. Every day is in relationship to the Sabbath. Okay, now with the sun and the moon, God's appointed times occur over how many months? Seven months. Now, what's very interesting about this relationship here, and what I'm going to suggest to you is there's a source channel relationship between seven days and seven months. Now, to enter into 
the, the calendar of the appointed times, we have to enter through the Passover, the cross. This is when the flesh, uh, he that has suffered in the flesh uh, has ceased from sin. 1 Peter 4.1, Christ uh, took our human nature, the flesh was stripped away. As we enter in through the Passover, we then are prepared to receive of his appointed times. The first appointed time after, we, after post, Passover is how many days? Unleavened bread is how many days? Seven days. And then how many, then you count seven times seven to get to the next appointed time, isn't it? Seven Sabbaths complete, seven days, seven weeks, and then to get to the final appointed times, we go seven months. Seven, seven, seven. Is that interesting? Now what's really interesting is that all of the appointed times of the seventh month are called Shabbaton. Day of Atonement is Shabbaton of Shabbat, but all three of them have Shabbaton. The Spring Feast don't mention Shabbaton. Only, only the Fall Feast mention Shabbaton in the seventh month, which means there is a special outpouring on the seventh month. But all of these appointed times are leading you to the seventh month, aren't they? So we have 777 leading you into the seventh month. What I find really interesting is that Jesus said in Matthew 11:28, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you... That word rest in the Greek is anapausis. Now when you read the Old Testament in Greek, that word is shabbaton. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you Shabbaton. Now, if Jesus is inviting you to receive his Shabbaton, wouldn't it be a good idea to come at the times when he's offering it? Which is every seventh day, and particularly on the seventh month. So we have entered into a time of the Shabbaton. This is a month of Shabbaton. And can you see how that the, the seven days, which is the source of the whole principle of the seven-day cycle is mirrored in the seven months. So that this and that the months in terms of time are an expansion of the week. So that the week is being expanded. And that you get seven days, seven weeks, seven months. And what's the other Sabbath? Seven years. You have a Sabbath principle in the days, in the weeks, in the months, in the years. Doesn't that sound like the Sabbath more fully to you? I better leave it there. There's a lot more I want to share. Can we pray? I'll pick this up again on the next presentation. Let's kneel and thank our Father. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus to realize that the fact of life is the of whom and by whom of the universe and that this pattern of life is the pattern for everything in the scriptures, in our life, in the word of God, in the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, in the commandments, in the book of the law. All of these things are based upon a worship of the one true God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we would come onto this platform fully and completely so that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge will be revealed to us. And Lord Jesus, we especially ask during this seventh month for an outpouring of your Shabbaton. And we believe that you'll give it to us because we've come to receive it and that you are the image of the invisible God. You are the expansion of your Father and that you'll give us in great measure this rest. And I thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name.